Hello, Math 1341 Calculus 1. This is extra practice for Quiz 3. And Quiz 3 covers 1, 5, 1, 6, and 2, 1. It's power rule, uh, increasing, decreasing, local max and min, global max and min. And then this one is higher derivatives and concavity. So there's a lot of topics here. Well, let's get started with the first problem. We want to find the global extreme values of this function g of x on the closed interval from 1 half to 4 and the x values where they occur. Well, this is a continuous function on a closed interval. We know it is guaranteed to have both a global max and global min. And how we go about that is first we search for our critical points. And so let's take the derivative. Uh, perhaps we can just rewrite this function. You notice that this is x squared and then this power is x to the minus one. Now I'm ready to take the derivative, g prime. This is power rule here. We have two x, and then we have minus two x to the negative two power. Well, the critical points are x values in the domain. In this case, I'm using this restricted domain, such that the first derivative is zero or does not exist. Well, you see, we can rewrite this we can rewrite this as 2x minus 2 over x squared. You notice this does not exist at x equals 0, but this is not inside my domain. And so I'm really interested in where the derivative is 0. What do we have here? Well, we would get 2x minus 2 over x squared is 0, or we have 2x equals 2 divided by x squared. Now at this point, how can I solve for x? Well, you notice I can just multiply through by x squared. I have 2x cubed equals 2, and this gives x cubed equals 1, and we see that x is 1. So we only have one um, place in our interval, 1 half to 4, where the first derivative is 0, but you know the critical points when you are working in a closed interval, we include the endpoints. So generally, my critical points for this function are we have 1 half, we have 1, and we have 4. Great. Now, highest overall y value, global max. Lowest overall y value, global min. And so what I just do, I know they must occur at critical points. I can just make a chart. Now remember, this is going to be g of x here because we are interested in y value. And in my chart, I put my three critical points, 1 half, 1, and 4, and I just evaluate my function. So maybe I'll do this over here on the side. g of 1 half, well, this is 1 half, squared plus 2 divided by 1 half. We don't want to leave it like this. In particular, we need to figure out which of these numbers is the biggest, and it's hard to figure out looking at it like this. So 1 half squared is 1 fourth. Here, we invert and multiply. 2 divided by 1 half is 2 times 2, which is 4. And so this is 4 and a fourth, or you could write this as 17 over 4. Now, g of 1, this is a little um, easier to evaluate in terms of we don't have any fractions. g of 1 is 1 plus 2 over 1, which is 3. And then finally, g of 4, we have 4 squared plus 2 over 4. This is 16 and a half. Maybe I will just write it as 16.5. It's fine. 16.5. And we could have written this also as decimal. Remember, it's four and a fourth. So that helps. Um, just now we compare, right? So seeing it like this or like this or like this, now we can actually compare. Okay, highest y value is here. This is the highest y value that we see. This is the lowest y value that we see. And so we're left with a global max of y equals 16.5 or 16 and a half. And this occurs at x equals four. And then we have a global min
of y equals three, and this occurs at x equals one. And so this is the end of this problem here. And here are our answers. Next question. This is really a fun one. Um, here I give you the derivative and the second derivative so we don't have to differentiate at all. It just uses the ideas of critical points, increasing, decreasing, local max and min, global max and min, and then concavity. But this kind of function, we will be able to differentiate very soon. It's just a little bit more involved than the, just the power rule. So that's why I give you these derivatives. Okay, first we wanna list the critical points of F. Well, if we go back to the definition, critical points are X values in the domain such that the first derivative is zero or does not exist. It's not a bad idea to think about the domain of the original function. Well, you see, this is defined everywhere. Minus infinity to infinity. Okay, now we can begin. We want to list the critical points of F. Well, these are places where the first derivative is zero or the first derivative does not exist. And the first derivative is handed to us as a fraction. And this will help us because the, a fraction generally is zero only when the numerator is. So this would be five X plus three is zero. And you notice we get X equals negative three here. Second, this fraction does not exist when the denominator is zero. So this would be when X minus one to the one third power is zero. And you can see this happens when X equals one. And so I have two critical points. My critical points are three and uh, negative three and one. Now, next. On what open intervals is the function increasing and similarly decreasing? Here we divide the domain into open intervals based on the critical points. And we already mentioned, discussed, the domain is the whole real line. So I have minus three, one, and I can write the open intervals underneath. This would be minus infinity to minus three. This would be minus three to one and one to infinity. Now I want to test the derivative, which is given to me. So everything I'm doing on this page is all using this function, the derivative. So what I do, at least this is the way I do it, is I pick a point at each interval, and then I just test the sign. So for instance, here I can use two, here I can use zero, here I can use say negative four. You don't have to pick the exact same points as me. The actual value of the first derivative will certainly vary over a given subinterval, but the sign will not. Okay, so let's make our chart. We have x, then we're testing at minus four, zero, and two. And then I can write it this way, five x plus three times it's x minus one to the negative one third. That way I just have it written as a product, but I could have written it as a quotient as well. And this will give me the sign of the first derivative. x minus three at negative four is negative. x minus one at negative four is negative. And certainly if you take to the one third power, it's still negative. So negative and negative, we have positive. So I can put a plus here. Now at zero, x plus three is positive, x minus one is negative, and similarly x minus one to the minus one third would be negative. So my first derivative is negative here. And finally at two, x plus three is positive, x minus one is positive, and positive, positive. So now I can write my conclusion about increasing and decreasing. My original function is increasing everywhere I see a plus, and this is two open intervals. It's minus infinity to minus three and one to infinity, and it's decreasing everywhere I see a minus, which is one open interval, minus three to one. Okay, so this is the answer to letter B. We have open intervals of increasing, 
and open interval of decreasing. Well, we can use this to classify critical points as local max, local min, or neither. What I tend to do is I just redraw my number line for each critical point. So here would be say minus three, and here is positive one. Now we make a sketch based on the pluses. Oh, let's redraw the pluses and minuses. So at minus three, we have a plus on this side and a minus on this side. And at positive one, I have a minus on this side and a plus on this side. Now I'm ready to sketch. So at minus three, my function is increasing and then decreasing. And at one, my function is decreasing and then increasing. And so now we can make a statement. You see, look at the picture. We have local max at x equals minus three. And we have local min at x equals one. So this is how we use the intervals of increasing, decreasing to classify our critical points. Now we have more parts for this problem too. The next part deals with concavity and I have just recopied our functions. The dr function, first derivative and second derivative. Okay, what intervals is the function concave up, concave down? Here, we wanna use this one, second derivative. So the potential places where the function switches concavity are where the second derivative is zero. The second derivative does not exist. Okay, so the second derivative is zero. The second derivative does not exist. Well, this happens, it's very similar to uh, first derivative. You see we're handed the second derivative as a fraction. The second derivative is zero. This happens only when the numerator is zero. So you have five, two x minus six, is zero, this happens at x equals three. Second derivative does not exist. This happens when the denominator is zero. So we have three x minus one to the four over three is zero. And this is when x is one. Now we divide our domain into open intervals based on the second derivative. It's a very similar process that we just did with increasing, decreasing. The only difference is I'm using second derivative and this tells me about concavity. So we have one and three, one and three. My open intervals are open one to three, open three to infinity and minus infinity to one. And then we pick a point in each interval and test. This time we're testing the second derivative. So we can pick four, we can pick two, we can pick zero. And then I can make a chart. So my chart, I have X. I'll have five, two X minus six. And then I'll have, I'll write it this way, one third X minus one to the negative four over three. This is giving me the second derivative. And I have these three places, zero, two, and four. Okay, what I wanna focus on for the moment is this part because I have a four. So here, you can also look at it here or here, but you have a four here, which is the even power. So fundamentally, we're raising something to the an even power, which as long as you're not one where this power is zero, this is a positive number. So I can just put pluses here, here, and here. If you don't trust yourself to make that kind of observation, you can always just evaluate this function at these three values in your calculator, perfectly fine. So now let's look at the sign of two X minus six. At zero, two X minus six is negative. At two, 2x minus six is also negative, and at four, 2x minus six is positive. So you see the second derivative goes negative, negative, positive. Let's put that underneath here. We have negative, negative, positive. So now I can make my final conclusion. Is concave up? 
everywhere I see a plus, which is three to infinity. The function is concave down. Well, it's everywhere we see a minus. And maybe the easiest way to leave our answer is just list the two intervals with a comma in between. So we have minus infinity to one and one to three. It's fine. So this is the answer for letter D. Now we need x values of inflection points. Inflection points are where, well, first of all, there are points on the graph or x values in the domain, but the concavity needs to switch. So you notice the concavity is not switching at one. X equals one is not an inflection point. But at three, concavity is switching. We switch from concave down on the one side, concave up on the other. So I have one answer here. This would just be x equals three, my only inflection point. The last part, part f, this is about global extrema of my continuous function on a closed interval. We're guaranteed to have a, both a global max and global min, just like number one. We've already solved for the critical points. However, we're working only now on the closed interval from zero to two. And you notice that minus three is not in the closed interval from zero to two. On this interval, zero to two, the only critical points are one and zero and two. The endpoints together with the critical point x equals one. So let's make our chart. We have x. And then we have f of x. This is y value. Don't use, don't evaluate the derivative here. Don't evaluate the second derivative here. Not for global extrema. As I mentioned in the first problem, all we care about is highest overall y value, global max, lowest overall y value, global min. And if you're on a closed interval, guaranteed to have both, provided the function's continuous, and they occur at critical points. So. Let's put our critical points, 0, 1, 2, and we evaluate the function at these three points. OK. f of 0, this is 3 um, times minus 1 to the 2 thirds power times 9. Well, Minus one to the two thirds is positive one. So we just have three times nine, which is 27. F of one. Here we have um, three times zero to the two thirds power times 10. This is zero. And finally, F of two. We have three times one to the two thirds power which is one, and then we have 11, nine plus two. So this is 33. Now we can make our conclusion. You see, highest overall y value, lowest overall y value. So let's just write this. We have a global max of y equals 33 at x equals two. We have global min, of y equals zero at x equals one. And this is the end of this problem. This is a really great problem, it has so many parts, but they're all really good for us. This problem used ideas from both sections, one five and one six. Here's another example, number three, where we list open intervals for concave up and down and inflection points. Now, unlike the last one, we're not given the derivative here. So we're going to be taking derivatives in order to get started on this problem. You also notice I am not asked about increasing, decreasing. I'm not asked about local max and min. So it's a little bit different than the last. But to get started, right, I need places where to get started, the second derivative is zero or does not exist. Those are potential inflection points. And it needs to be in the domain. This is a polynomial, so the domain is all real numbers, minus infinity to infinity. OK, so first we take the first derivative. Here we have x cubed. We have plus 12x squared, then minus 60x. OK, second derivative. We differentiate the first derivative. So we have 3x squared. We have plus 24x 
minus 60. This is what I need to set to zero um, technically or does not exist. But you see, this is just a quadratic. This is defined everywhere. So the second derivative not existing does not occur in this problem. Let's see, I can factor out a three from every term. So I have x squared, I have eight x, and I have minus 20. The question is, how do I factor this? Well, let's see, one will be negative and one will be positive because I need two numbers to multiply to negative 20. Let's try 10 and two. Ah, I think this is going to be good. So we're going to have a positive 10 and minus two. Okay, now multiplies to 20 and these numbers add to eight. So very nice, we have factored this. Well, you see, we can solve now. We have x equals 2 and minus 10. These are the potential inflection points. Now, divide the domain into open intervals based on these numbers. Here's minus 10 and 2. And my open intervals I can write underneath. We have negative 10 to 2. We have 2 to infinity. We have minus infinity to minus 10, like this. Okay, we pick a point at each interval. Let's use x equals three. Let's use x equals zero. Let's use x equals negative 11. And then we test the second derivative. This is about concavity. So really, let's see if I can change this. We do not use this again. The first derivative was only a step on our way to calculate the second derivative, but I don't use it again. I'm testing the second derivative here because the second derivative being positive or negative or is what tells us concave up or concave down. Okay, so if I make my chart factored, the second derivative is three, x plus 10, x minus two, and then I will just multiply signs to give me the sign of the second derivative. And I'm testing negative 11, I'm testing zero and three. Okay, so at negative 11, x plus 10 is negative, x minus two is negative, second derivative is positive. At zero, x plus 10 is positive, x minus two is negative, second derivative is negative. And at three, x plus 10 is positive, x minus two positive and positive. So let's put this underneath. Um, we have positive. I'll do it in pink. Positive. We have negative. We have positive. And so now I'm ready to um, give my answer. In fact, the answer for B will just be immediate after we write down our answer for A. But we want open intervals where the function is concave up. We want open intervals where the function is concave down. and Concave up everywhere we see a plus. So minus infinity to minus 10 and two to infinity. It's concave down everywhere we see a minus, which is just one open interval, minus 10 to two. Now, letter B, inflection points. Well, we can see, you see at minus 10, we are switching concave up on one side, concave down on the other. Also at two, we are switching concave down on one side, concave up on the other. And so both of these x values are inflection points. Sometimes it works out nicely like this. We have negative 10 and two. Here's the answer to B and one, two, that's the answer for letter A. Okay, last problem. We want to find the first and second derivatives for each function. This is a power rule exercise, but it's also very nice because we have to practice writing a function as x to a power or t to a power as in the case of part c. So for this first one, you notice, what do I have? I have nine x to the minus five. I have plus three x to the minus two. The first one, letter A, we want y prime. We're ready for the power rule. We have nine times minus five, which is minus 45, x to the power minus one. We have three times minus two, which is negative six, x to the power minus one, minus three. This is the first
first derivative. Now, second derivative. Well, we just differentiate again. We have minus 45 times minus six, which will be positive 270. And then we have x to the minus seven. Then we have minus six times minus three, which will be positive 18, x to the minus four. That was letter A. Letter B, well, once again, let's rewrite everything as a power. And you see, I have lots of sixes here. This is x over six. We have minus six over x. And then we have a plus the sixth root of x. So you notice this first one is just one sixth times x. The next one is minus six times x to the minus one. And then the sixth root, this is the one over six power. So we have x to the one over six. Now I'm in really great shape to use power rule on each term. Letter B, h prime of x. Well, the derivative of x is just one. So I have one sixth. Then minus six times minus one is plus six, x to the minus two. Then I have plus one over six, x to the minus five over six, power rule. One sixth minus one is negative five over six. This is the first derivative. Now second derivative. Well, the derivative of a constant is zero. So this part has derivative zero. We have six times minus two. Then we have x to the minus three. Now one six times minus five over six is minus five divided by 36. And then we have x to the minus 5 6. Minus 1 is negative 11 6. OK, letter C. This is the last one. Well, once again, let's rewrite w in terms of powers. So we have the square root of t cubed. The power here is 3 halves. So we have t to the 3 halves. And then this is just a number times t. OK, so maybe I'll write it this way, dw dt. I'm using different notation. It's good to be comfortable with all of this notation. OK, power rule. We have 3 halves, t to the 1 half. And then pi is just a constant, so we have plus pi. Now, differentiate again, d squared w divided by dt squared. We have 3 halves times 1 half, which is 3 fourths, t to the 1 half minus 1, negative 1 half. And then derivative of a constant is 0. OK, so well, maybe the only thing I'll do is just change when we rewrote the functions to a different color. Because you notice, this is not the derivative. All I did was rewrite each term as coefficient times x or t to a power. Then I was able to apply the power rule. So this is the end of this question, and this is the end of quiz three extra practice. Thank you so much, students. Good luck on your quiz.